World history, we're back. Last time we left off, the Germans had violated and broke the contract of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, and now they're moving into the Soviet Union to try and defeat communism. Now, reminder to the class, this is our last lecture before the exam. Next time I see you after this video, we're going to have our exam on World War II that begins in 1931 and ends in the summer of 1942. Next unit is from the summer of 1942 on. So that's just a quick reminder for the class. So let's get back to the Germans and the Soviets. Now, in June of 1941, there's a German advance into the Soviet Union. Now, stop me if any of this sounds familiar when we're comparing and contrasting Hitler to Napoleon. So they invade in the summer, thinking that they have a superior military to that of the Soviets, which they did, but they underestimated the Soviet willpower, the Soviet ability to never surrender, and then they also un misunderstood the scorched earth tactic that the Soviets were gonna use on the Germans the same way they used it on the French when Napoleon invaded Russia. So Stalin is unprepared for this invasion for two reasons. Number one, he had agreed to the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, thinking that that would be in place throughout this time period. That's obviously going to be a miscalculation on Stalin's part. And then the second reason, when Stalin took over, he was incredibly paranoid. He is uh, most likely a sociopath. And what happened was, is he purged his military of all of the military generals. He purged his military of all the leadership. He purged a lot of the people around him and had all of these people executed. So when the Germans invade the Soviet Union, you got brand new generals, brand new military leaders, brand new people surrounding Stalin. So the Soviets were completely unprepared for this invasion. Now, during this invasion, 2.5 million Russian soldiers are killed trying off to fend off the invaders. Now keep in mind, they're gonna fight and retreat, and fight and retreat, and when they retreat, they're gonna burn everything to the ground so the Germans have nothing to use as they advance through Soviet Union. Now keep in mind that Russia is humongous and has a horrific winter. So the Russians have used this in multiple conflicts, this policy or this tactic of scorched earth, as the enemies come in and eventually you just bleed their supply lines dry and then the winter takes care of the invading forces better than the Soviet military could. Now, like I said, the Russians burned everything to the ground, scorched earth policy, and most Germans, again, sounds a lot like Napoleon again, most Germans believe that victory would come soon, but the winter weather is gonna stall that advance and then eventually all of these German soldiers are going to be surrounded. So let's get into the next slide. Now it's important to remember that Stalin was just as ruthless as Adolf Hitler, but because Stalin let his own people suffer and killed his own people and Hitler was such a monster, Stalin sometimes gets a free pass in history, but he was just as cruel, especially to his own people. And there, that's gonna be very evident in the next few slides. And there's two very important cities that are symbolic and important in this conflict. And those are the cities of Leningrad, named after V.I. Lenin, and Stalingrad, obviously named after Joseph Stalin. So Hitler's gonna target those cities for a couple reasons. Number one, their strategic importance, but also because of the symbolic nature of those cities and what that would mean to capture those cities from the Soviet Union. So the siege of Leningrad takes place in September of 1941, again, Late summer, starting to get into early fall, the Germans think they're gonna wipe out the Soviets real quick here. And you can see from the next point that this battle took two and a half years, two and a half years. So it certainly wasn't done by the end of summer and it wasn't even done within that calendar year. Now in those two and a half years, food was scarce and one million civilians died in that city. And because it was surrounded, those civilians would just lay on the ground and sometimes they would freeze in position during that winter. So Stalin let his civilians suffer during these conflicts because for a number of reasons, he felt that it was sending a message, it was strategic, and also it was the only way to defeat the Germans was to surround the Germans when the Germans surround these cities. Now, Stalin wanted Britain to open up a second front to relieve pressure off the Soviet Union. Remember, the Germans and the Soviets are fighting long before the United States gets involved. So, 
They're begging. Stalin is saying to uh, Britain, please invade northern France and take some pressure off us so Hitler can take some of these troops and bring them back to the Western Front. But let's not forget, Western democracies hated communism and fascism. So Western democracies didn't really have a problem with the fascists taking out the communists, and then they would turn their attention towards the fascists. So this is the geopolitical situation of the time. Now let's check in with Washington DC and see what FDR and the United States Congress are up to. Now keep in mind, up to this point, up to the slide, Congress had told FDR, we are isolationist on this. We're not entering into any European conflicts like we did during World War I. And they went so far as to pass the Neutrality Acts. Now the Neutrality Acts stated that the United States couldn't trade with nations that were warring and couldn't give them money or assistance if they were in the middle of a war. This is gonna change with this act, the Lend-Lease Act. And FDR is gonna debut this to the United States with a very famous speech, the speech that's titled The Arsenal of Democracy. Now an arsenal is a weapon cache, a place where you keep a bunch of weapons. And if it, the United States is gonna be the arsenal of democracy, that means we are going to lend weapons to nations that are fighting against fascism. So the speech is given in a way where the phrasing is that the United States can send or lend weapons or give financial assistance to any nation whose defense was vital to the United States national security. Now that's a very broad scope. You could say anything is vital to United States national security. So because you have that broad scope, the United States is starting to get further and further into entering this conflict. Winston Churchill wanted to join this fight. He wants to take it to the Nazis. He wants to go back into France and he wants to push the Germans back into Berlin. But Churchill knows he's gonna need the United States' help on this. So, the only way you can get the United States involved is to get FDR involved and have FDR convince Congress to get involved. So, this slide is a secret meeting in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Something that would be an impossibility today in 2021 with news media and access and all of that. Also, FDR was afflicted with polio as a young child and paralyzed from the waist down which was also hidden from the United States public for his entire presidency. So Churchill is gonna ask FDR to meet him on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And that's gonna be known as the Atlantic Charter and it takes place in August of 1941. Now, Roosevelt and Churchill are gonna meet secretly. That's key there. This is a secret meeting in the Atlantic. Both were heavy drinkers. So they're gonna be drinking and negotiating terms for what Europe is gonna look like and how to get it back to where it was. So you have two of the most important world leaders meeting in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a boat deciding how to attack Nazi fascism. So the charter set goals for the war. And you can see in this picture right behind me, that is a picture of the original Atlantic Charter. You have the typed up charter and then you have handwritten notes by both gentlemen. So. Point number one, destroy Nazi fascism. Get rid of it, eradicate it from Europe. Also, after the war has ended, people of all nations should be able to decide their own form of government. This is known as self-determination or autonomy. Autonomy means freedom to make your own choices. The third thing that they were going to put in place. Now remember, we're gonna go back to Woodrow Wilson. You remember Woodrow Wilson had the 14 points? And the only point that was accepted by Britain and France was the League of Nations. And then Woodrow Wilson comes back and the United States Congress says, great, but we can't be in it. You can't be in the League of Nations, which was the end of the League of Nations before it even started. Now, these two gentlemen understood the importance of the idea of the League of Nations, and they came up with the concept of the United Nations. So the United Nations is the third point agreed upon at the Atlantic Charter, and that would be a permanent system of general security. Now, none of this matters if the Allies don't defeat the Axis powers. So this is a plan that is put in place that if the Allies defeat the Axis powers, these things are going to be put in place. Then both gentlemen leave the boat, Churchill goes back to Britain, 
FDR goes back to Washington, D.C., and now we're escalating to get the United States involved in this conflict. And the one thing that's going to get them involved overnight is going to be the bombing of Pearl Harbor, where this particular unit is going to end. Now this gentleman right here might be small in stature, but this is Hideki Tojo. And Hideki Tojo was incredibly intelligent, calculated, and ruthless. So do you remember, first semester, we talked about the code of conduct in Europe known as chivalry. And I told you during first semester that the code of conduct of chivalry was gonna to come to a head with the code of conduct of Bushido. Now remember, feudalism in Europe and Japan without them talking together developed naturally. You had knights or you had samurais. You had lords or you had shoguns. So now you're gonna see these two codes of conduct run into each other in the Pacific conflict. And chivalry, if you recall, if you have two knights fighting and one knight loses the sword, the other knight is supposed to allow the other knight to get their sword so the fight can be fair. There were rules to combat, rules to conduct. In Bushido, it is a very different code of conduct. In Bushido, it is win at all costs. In Bushido, surrendering is seen as less than human. You are treated like a cockroach if you surrender at any point. It is fight until the death, never surrender. And this is also going to shape how prisoners are treated during these conflicts. If you're a prisoner in Europe, there is a small code of conduct still as a holdover from chivalry. If you're a prisoner of war in Japan, that means you surrendered, which means you're less than a cockroach in their eyes, and they treated you accordingly. Now, let's go back to how we get involved in the Pacific conflict. Because keep in mind, the Atlantic Char Charter just happened. Japan is not somebody that the United States is really thinking about, and they're over here. They're concentrating on Nazi fascism. FDR is cooperating with Churchill in secret, and that's why this attack is so surprising, because now you're turning around and you're fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, and eventually you're gonna be fighting the Nazis and the Italians in Europe. So, growing tensions. Japan is gonna seize territory in the Pacific, and they're gonna get as many islands as they can, and they're going to get closer and closer and closer to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And eventually the plan was to get closer and closer and closer to the United States. So to stop Japan, the United States banned the sale of war materials to Japan, the most important being oil. So remember, Japan, small, doesn't have a lot of resources. They got to go get their resources elsewhere. And when the United States cuts off their oil supply, the Japanese feel that the only way to get that oil back is to attack the United States and take the oil back. So, Japan and the United States held talks to try and ease these tensions right before the Pearl Harbor attack. And then the night before the Pearl Harbor attack, you have all these ambassadors leaving, all these diplomats leaving, all of them destroying their equipment and going back to Japan, which is an incredibly bad sign. And keep in mind that Pearl Harbor, if you got stationed there, you're in Hawaii, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, and you don't expect the Japanese attack. So all of this was very, very surprising, and you went from living in paradise to living in hell in one, one day. So, General Hideki Tojo, who was the military leader and prime minister of Japan. Now remember, ultimately, Hirohito, who's the emperor, has to approve all of this stuff, but Tojo is really the person in charge, and running it through Tojo, or running it through uh, Hirohito, and convincing Hirohito of these plans. So they're gonna drop the plan of the Pearl Harbor attack, which is conducted on December 7, 1941.